The brain, a pulpy mass of cells and fibers, is the center of the network of fibers that make up man's nervous system. Extending upward into the skull, the spinal cord widens to form the brain stem. I want everybody to say this with me at the same time, say the Wisdom Society. I don't want you just to be intellectual. I want you to be wise. The Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously. There's no reason for anybody to lack wisdom. At the end of the year, I went what I thought was kind of yucky stuff you have to deal with. I spent about two and a half, three months, you know, we talked about generational curses. I mean, that's like, you know, get this stuff off me. Went from generational curses, <coughs> pardon me, to <coughs> yokes that need to be destroyed and burdens that need to be removed. And we landed there two or three, maybe four weeks. Then I left that and went into strongholds. Curses, yokes, strongholds. And it was just highly spiritual, highly intense stuff where you have to confront, you, you have to confront the stuff that you know is in your family, the, the mindsets <clears throat> that you've had that are sabotaging your future and the things that happened to you and the scars that it left and the yokes that it placed on your life and all this stuff had to be broken. To me, it was intensely deep and it was intensely spiritual and it was intensely introspective. So now, the first of this year, I'm going to swing the pendulum all the way to the other direction, and I'm going to go highly practical. This is very fun. I love teaching this stuff. You don't get it much. It's usually things that I teach in much smaller forums. Uh, this stuff is new. Some of this I've never taught before. But I felt like God wanted me to come out of the gate this year and take about maybe six or eight weeks. The book of Proverbs is probably my second favorite book in the Bible. I was not a great student, but I always had people tell me that I had wisdom beyond my years. Because there's a lot of people that in college you made A's, but you're working for people who made C's. Well, we're starting off real good, isn't it? Because you can be highly intellectual and not have a lick of wisdom. People that are wise know how to move their life forward. Just because you have accumulated a lot of knowledge and you're intellectual, and we have a lot in this area, just because you have those things, it does not mean that you specifically know how to use what you've got. And so I got today, I'm gonna to talk about things like wisdom, discipline, mission, purpose, vision, I want to talk about some of these things because once you deal with the, the curses, the yokes, and the strongholds, and you kind of get free, it's kind of like, now what? Okay? Practical things are spiritual things. Okay? When it comes to wisdom, I would like for everybody over this next six to eight weeks to read the whole book of Proverbs. If you've never done it, Proverbs actually is the wisdom of God. What does it mean? The book of Proverbs is how God thinks. Okay? There's three principal people or personality types in the book of Proverbs. The simple, the scorner, and the fool. Hope that you don't find yourself in one of those descriptions. The simple, the scorner, and the fool. God helps me, I may open that up a little deeper later on in this teaching. But we're just going to get, can, can I just get, this stuff's hard to preach. Can I just, can I get real practical and come down and teach these things and, and you dial in and stay with me? Because I think they'll be immensely beneficial. It's almost going to feel like I'm a little bit of a life coach type guy uh, the next few weeks. 
And I need you to let me kind of challenge you, especially when I start dabbling in the discipline stuff, because discipline doesn't come easier. Everybody'd have it. Okay. Are y'all here? Yeah. Okay. I feel like you're already like, oh God, what's he going to make me do? I'm not going to make you do anything. I'm going to suggest some things to you. Guys, if you would, uh, back in the back, let me just start with this scripture, 1 Corinthians 10 and 23. Terrence, if you would, keep playing until I finish this scripture. <clears throat> then I'll go straight to Habakkuk 2. I love this stuff. All things are lawful for me. Wow. Preachers don't read that one, do they? Because they want to control things. But the fact is, when it comes to your relationship with God, you're on your own, and the law is no longer against you. In other words, you don't need to tempt God with your sin, but God's not chasing you down trying to whip you real good if you screw up. There is no law anymore against you. Jesus has fulfilled the law. You're now inside of him. So all things are lawful for me, but now there is a higher level I have to ascend to. Most Christians are stuck in trying to decipher right and wrong, and I'm trying not to sin, and I'm trying to do right, and I'm trying not to sin, and I'm trying to do right. Well, he comes out and says, there's a day where you got to get above just trying to do the right thing. You got to start doing the wise thing. All things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. That word helpful means to bring together. The word edify means to build up. So I can go out and do what I want to and God's not gonna cast me aside, but it may not bring the pieces of my life together and it may not propel me into a forward motion. So let's go higher than just saying, is it right or is it wrong? Now let's ask a question, Does it, is it wise for me to participate? This is good stuff, I'm telling you, we're going to a good place. Is it beneficial? I've always taught you, even in my short time as pastor, there are things you can't do to be you. There are things that Ron Carpenter cannot participate in, not because they're wrong, but I can't do it and be me. There are relationships I can't have. There are people I can't run with. I have removed myself from so many circles. Not that those people are bad, but I can't have that relationship and go where I'm gonna go. So I have to make a wise, nothing's wrong, nothing's unlawful, but I have to make a wise decision. They're not going where I'm going and I refuse to compromise my future to have a friend. Uh, is it beneficial? Is it helpful? Is it wrong for you to date that guy? No. Is it helpful? No. <laughs> Activities, people, relationships, things. Just things I can't do, the things that, the things that I have to do. Last night, <laughs> I preached to about uh, 2,000 people of 2,000 in, in a Russian convention. Very interesting night I had last night. Very moving, very inspiring. I hadn't had anything since lunch. It was midnight. We were on the road coming back from Sacramento. It was late. I was starving. I don't eat fast food. Very rarely ever. It's when I don't have any options. But last night I was hungry. I said, guys, we got to go through a drive-thru. So they ordered the meal, which means the drink, the fries, and the sandwich. The next one, the drink, the fries, and the sandwich. I said, get me the burger. I'm going to take off the bun. I'm going to drink water. Don't get me fries and don't get me the drink. We was riding down the road, and the person driving said, man, didn't you want some fries? I said, yeah, I wanted some fries. <laughs> I didn't get cheese. Do I want cheese? I love cheese. <laughs> Would I have rather had a Coke 
Then a Dasani. Every day of the week, twice on Sunday. <laughs> but what I felt did not make the decision. Because the vision I have for my life causes me to impose standards upon myself. <laughs> my dad died at 62 years of age. Best man I've ever known. Outside of Jesus, had to be one of the best men that ever walked this planet. And he died only eight years older than I am right now. I have a vision for my life to with long life see the salvation of the Lord. So that means I have to employ things in my life. Was there anything wrong with cheese and mayonnaise and ketchup and mustard and fried? What is it about a fried potato and ketchup? <laughs> it's better than filet mignon. <laughs> but just that little thing, just that little thing last night had nothing to do with feelings. Because as feelings drive your life, you are headed for disaster. Because feelings change like the wind. So you can't let them make the decision for you. Is it wrong? No. Let's ask another question. Does it benefit me? Father, bless your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Are y'all interested in this? I can't get a feel for you right now. Wait, wait, I can't. I'm just okay. Give me a few minutes to break it down. I know there's ball games on today, but I, I don't want to cut this short. I really studied hard uh, to prepare this and put it in order so I could deliver it today. Habakkuk 2. We're about to go somewhere with this. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say. Habakkuk, Old Testament prophet. He has just told God something that he didn't like about him and he's waiting for God to correct him. See what he will say and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered and said to him, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Let me tell you how vision works. When you begin a vision, you have to defend it. When you have accomplished it, it will defend you. You speak at the beginning, it speaks at the end. <laughs> Though it tarries, wait for it. That's the discipline part. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. The vision is for an appointed time but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Tell your neighbor, say, here we go. Tell your neighbor also, say, give him about 20 minutes. Give him about 20 minutes, yeah. And I'll, I'll work this. Wisdom is defined by Ron Carpenter as two things. I didn't get this out of Webster Dictionary. This is mine. Wisdom is the ability to know difference. Difference. There were five people back in the ready room this morning all tending to their duties. But when my wife walked in, I got up. Because she's different. Man, it would do you well and it'd be wise for you to know she's different from you. She's on a cycle. You are not. She has hormones you do not have which gives her permission to act ways you can't get away with. <laughs> it's wisdom to know the difference. Two thieves on the cross beside Jesus. One of them was cursing him and the other one said, remember me. One of the thieves knew this man's different. The ability to recognize difference. The ability to recognize when a man of God or a woman of God has walked into a room. The ability to recognize an opportunity, a moment that needs to be seized that may never come around to you again. 
to realize I'm standing in front of an open door. Blind Bartimaeus started screaming and acting like a mad fool. Why? Because after 38 years of blindness, he found out that Jesus was going to pass by. And he stepped out and started screaming his guts out. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody told him to shut up and the Bible said he got louder. Why? Because wisdom says this is my moment. I've waited my whole life. This may never come to me again. And I don't care how you act. I'm going to act like a fool. Separate myself from everybody because I refuse to go home today blind. Ow! Somebody shout amen. Wisdom to know a moment is coming and step out and seize that moment. Wisdom knows the difference. Wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge. One of my great mentors who's gone on to be with the Lord told me, this is what he told me one time, I I embraced it as a great compliment. He said, I love teaching and investing and instructing you. I said, why is that? Because he had many people that looked to him for information and instruction. I said, why is that? He said, because by the next time I see you, you have done everything I've said. Wisdom is the ability to apply, apply. Take the C student who can apply what he knows and the A student who can't will work for them every time because it's not intellect, it's wisdom. Solomon was the wisest man on the earth and the book of Proverbs is the wisdom of God written by King Solomon, okay? In Habakkuk right here, I want to talk about this difference thing. Wisdom is knowing difference. If you came to the marriage conference, and I don't think we have 50 spots still left, but we, get, we do have a few. I have a section where I take this principle and I go in depth. I'm going to hit it for about four minutes here. Nature determines behavior. Nature always determines behavior. In other words, if you know the nature and understand the nature of a thing, its behavior will never surprise you. Babies cry. If you understand, they can't communicate. And the nature of a baby is to cry You won't sit there and go, why is this baby crying? It's its nature. Don't mean it doesn't get on your nerves, but it should not surprise you. If you understand the nature of a teenager, which lives in the moment, has no thought of tomorrow, then their behavior will not surprise you. Okay? I was disappointed in some things my kids did, but very rarely was I surprised because I was once a teenager. Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. And if you understand the nature of a teenager, if you understand the nature of a man, lady, now ladies, let me tell you something. Men keep getting bigger, but they never exceed age eight. Forty-eight years old, coming up out the basement and got his little model car he's been putting together. Look, look, look! You, yeah, baby, that's good. That's good. <laughs> so, if you understand the simplicity of a man and the nature of a man, I tell them that a woman is like the cockpit of a seven forty-seven jet. A man is like a light switch, kind of on and off. It's either on or it's either off. You know. And you have to know the nature of it. Men, if you understand the nature of a woman, write a book because nobody else does. Hallelujah. (laughs) I don't expect the dog to act like a cat. Dogs want to be petted all the (laughs) time. You know, just pet them. Cats, they choose when to let you pet them. And if you pet them when they don't want to be pet I don't expect a lion to act like a lamb because I understand the nature of that it's a predator. Its behavior does not surprise me when it's trying to rip another animal to shreds. Wisdom knows difference. 
and to be able to tell the difference in people, in the time, in the moment. I teach everybody on this praise team. I love our praise team. I love the youth. I love the passion. I love everything. I love where we're going. I'm so excited about the future, Red Worship. But I teach them all the time. I say, anybody can sing the songs of the age. Everybody's putting out songs. Elevation put out, Bethel's putting out songs. We hope to be putting out songs. Maverick City's put. everybody sings the songs of the age. I said, but that doesn't make a great worship leader. It's can you do what Lizzie and Andrew did and recognize we hit a moment. That's wisdom. And I watch what they did as they saw, okay, it's shifted now. We're no longer singing the song of an age. We are in a moment. And they take that moment and work it and let God do what he wants to do in that moment. You can't teach that. That's not taught. <laughs> you either have that or you don't. And I watched it happen because it was coincided with what I wanted to talk about today. The wisdom of recognizing now we're no longer just singing songs on a script. God has come into the room and gotten involved. And then my wife recognizes we're in a moment. She walks over here and she taps me. And I'm like, this will be better coming from you than it would for me. What, I, what was all that? That was the wisdom of God to know the difference of what's happening in the room. Now, if you're just intellectual, you can miss all those moments. But you know a lot of things, but don't have the wisdom to embrace the door that God just opened. Okay? So, can I go deeper? That was a little weak. Can I go deeper? Okay. <laughs> All right. I want to get to vision, and I'm going to end out in the book of Habakkuk. But let me get there. Purpose. Purpose is the original intent for which a thing was created. It is the journey and the hunt of all humanity. Why am I here? There's a lot of things that go into that that I don't have time and that's not where I want to bog down. But purpose is the original intent. Then you have to move to mission. Mission is the strategy by which purpose will be accomplished. See, wise people can move from number one to number two. They know what God wants and they know how to set a course. For every vision, there is a vehicle. If I'm going across town, I better have a car. Okay? If I'm going across the nation, I better have a plane. If I'm going across the ocean, I better have a boat. So what vehicle do you have to build to fulfill your purpose? And most people don't know how to build what's going to take them from A to B. I am preaching better than you're amen in right now. Okay. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this. You go from purpose to mission, then to vision. Vision is the unique part that you play that only you can fulfill in the earth. It's the picture that God gives you on the inside of how your purpose will be accomplished, okay? So what is all this, why this purpose and mission and vision? Because Habakkuk comes on the scene and he doesn't talk about prophecy and end times. God starts talking to him about vision. Go back to Habakkuk 1 and verse 2. Right, verse 2 and verse 2, excuse me. 2 and verse 2. Write the vision down and make it plain that he may run who reads it. Okay, here we go. I'm going to make Hope say amen. She's going to love this so good right here what I'm about to preach. <sighs> Two things will have to come to your vision or you will never see it. Your vision will remain a pipe dream in your mind when you lay down at night and stare at the ceiling. If you don't get resources and you don't get people. One thing about destiny is you will not arrive there alone. Let's, let's quit saying resources. Let's quit covering up with it. Money. If you don't have money and you don't have people, you'll die with your dream in you. Look what he says about vision. Make the vision plain. We do this by writing it down. That they who read it may run with it. 
So that verse tells me that God has already pre-assigned people to show up in your life the moment the vision becomes plain on the inside of you. God has already had people assigned to enter your life and to exit your life. See, we, we get offended, we get hurt, we get heartbroken over the people who exit, but you don't understand their exiting was just as much the will of God as their entrance. Because there's two kind of relationships. There's the building and then there's the scaffolding. When they were getting these beams in place, they erected scaffolding. And the scaffolding was there to help get the permanent structure in place. But after <coughs> the permanent structure was in place, they take the scaffolding down. And some of us don't understand that's the way God works relationships. There are a few people in our life that are a part of the permanent structure. It'll be a very few. But there'll be many people that enter and exit, enter and exit, enter and exit. Because they were there for a certain point to run with you and help you get into a certain place. And then they are to exit gracefully just like they entered. And then you'll be left with a few friends at the end who are the permanent structure of your life. Quit mourning the people who exited that God never intended to go the distance with you. Somebody shout amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That they that read it may run it, write it down, make it plain. Now, if your vision is not plain to you, how am I going to run with you? Point, point in case, right here. We have a network of pastors. I license and ordain them all over America and some places all over the world. They have an application process. There's a one-year process, two-year process, three-year process. It's very, it's very in-depth. It's not a piece of paper that we send somebody and they got a certificate. It has meaning to it. So we have an examining committee. And I have people come in and tell me this. What is it you'd like to do? Why are you applying for a minister's license? Well, I just want to go into the ministry. <laughs> I just love Jesus. <laughs> I want to go in ministry. Food ministry? Clothes ministry? Mission ministry? Teaching ministry? Altar ministry? Worship ministry? Children's ministry? Youth ministry? I, I can't run with you. I don't know what that means. I know you're crying. I know you've been touched by God. I believe you love him. But money's not coming and people are not coming. Because if it's ambiguous and vague inside of you, how am I going to lock arms and run with you? <clears throat> and some of us have never spent time bringing clarity to our future. We got saddled with bills, we, we had kids, we backed into life through the back door and all of a sudden we had responsibilities before we ever had a chance to have vision and so we're just making it day by day by day. But this New Year's, I tried to make you write down five things. Have you ever stopped to think, what is inside of me? What gifts do I possess? What makes me happy? When am I fulfilled? And what could the vision, what could the original intent for my life be? And begin to strategize in that direction. Ron Carpenter, you are preaching. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? I waited three and a half years to get married to the most beautiful, hottest thing I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> now, we did it the old school way. You don't have sex until you get married, which is the Bible way, by the way. Okay. So the Bible says it's better to marry than to burn. I was burning up like a hot flame fireplace. <laughs> but I did not want to create responsibility before I created a life. I wanted to know who am I, what is God's original intent for my life, and what is the strategy we need to put forth to go there. Then we waited four to five more years to have kids. And all that was done intentionally. Why? Because I didn't want to stumble through life. I wanted to have a strategy through life. 
You say, well, it didn't work out that way for me. Yes, but you have the ability to stop and mash reset at any time. That is the good thing about God. Any day is a brand new day with God. His mercies are new every morning. Come on. His grace is new every morning. And any time you stop to make the decision and say, God, I've been doing it my way and I've never even asked you, what do you want? What have you put in me and what do you have for my life? It's amazing what God can show you. <laughs> well, I just, you know, I just want a relationship with you, Pastor. I don't, I don't know what that means. Well, I just want to be happy. What do you want God to do with your life? Let's pray. I just want to be happy. <laughs> They're not coming. Nobody invests in what's not clear. And God said, write it down. Bring clarity to it because I have already assigned people to run with you as soon as you get clarity on what I've called you to do. That's worth a clap, amen, right there. <clears throat> Can I have five more minutes? <clears throat> Proverbs 29. Where there is no vision, the King James says, people perish. The New King James says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Probably pick too big a one to end on. <clears throat> Where there is no vision, people perish. It don't mean they fall over dead. But where there is no picture of the future, people have no boundaries. I'm just living for the moment. And because anything goes... It tells me you have no vision for your life. Because as soon as you have a vision, parameters start coming in. Some of you think you need to be delivered at an altar. A vision would deliver you. I can't tell you what knowing every day that I'm your pastor keeps me out of. I have a responsibility to you that keeps me in check. And there are lines I can't cross because of who I am to you. I feel, I'm gonna tell you, I feel the anointing in here right now. I feel, I feel the power. I know it's highly practical, but some of you, the light's coming on right now. Where there is no picture of tomorrow, anything goes. Well, Pastor, that's right. I am, I'm one of those people, man. I'm just a free spirit, anything goes. And the fact that anything goes, it tells me you have no picture of your tomorrow. So anything goes today, why? Because tomorrow doesn't matter. In other words, the last word, discipline. Where there's no vision, people cast off restraint. When vision comes into focus, discipline is self-imposed standards. I had to preach to you this morning, even though I got home late Friday and was gone all day yesterday. I still spent about three and a half hours preparing for you. Do you, what, do you know what? Nobody called me and said, you need to study, Ron. You got several thousand people showing up Sunday. You need to study. I didn't have no encouragement committee. I didn't have no telecare ministry calling my phone. But I had a responsibility to you that imposed a standard. So it's not movie time and it's not Netflix time. It was the only time I had and it became study time. Because I had a vision for this morning. It made me discipline my time yesterday. Are you seeing what I'm saying? I'm trying to make it simple. 
I know what food to say yes to and what food to say no to. I know what activities to say yes to and what to say no to. I know the things that I can do and the things I can participate in. I know how much time I can spend away versus how much time I need to be here and be on my assignment. I know all these things. Why? Because vision has brought that into focus and vision has created these great boundaries in my life that I wouldn't take nothing for. But if all that was taken from me, if all that was taken, then the boundaries tend to go with it. <laughs> and some of you say, man, I want to quit this mess and I want to quit, I ended up in this same place. No. Where there is a vision, people are disciplined. Self-imposed standards. Nobody else has got to keep an eye on you. You will impose them upon yourself because you see something tomorrow that's so great, it'll make you discipline yourself today. Can we put our hands together and give Jesus praise? You can stand with me all over the building. Hallelujah. Turn around to at least two or three people and say, he really was talking to you. <laughs> Will you come back next week and take this journey with me? It'll help us. It really will. I love you and I believe this year is going to be amazing. I don't care what the prognosticators say. They don't run my life. CNN and Fox and all the rest of them don't run my life. My life is run by God. Hallelujah. And God says this is going to be the greatest times of your life. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. May God establish you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Enjoy your Sunday and I'll see you next week. God bless.